Yeah. What, what happened there? <laughs> All right. We're going to go ahead and do our scripture reading this morning. As soon as the music stops. There we go. And this morning's scripture is from John 1, 29 through 34. The next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he on behalf of whom I said, After me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. I did not recognize him. But so that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing in water. John testified saying, I have seen the spirit descending as a dove out of heaven. And he remained upon him. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, he upon whom you see the spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. I myself have seen and have testified that this is the Son of God. Yes, amen, amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. <clears throat> Let us pray again. Lord, we just thank you so much, God, for your word. Your word is life. Your word is truly amazing, God. It is spirit. God, it is it's just like water to our souls. God, as um, J.D. comes this morning to bring forth that word, I just pray that it will continue to just grow in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Tony. Y'all can be seated. <laughs> All right, ladies and gents, as you know, is she, is, did Miss Alana go to kids? Okay, very good. All right, we will present it at the end of service then. We have a Bible for her. So. All right, so we're going to be in um, the Gospel of Luke as normal. We're starting chapter 3 today. So woot, woot, we're already two chapters down. All right. <laughs> so the thing about Luke, uh, remember chapter 3, so it's in the New Testament. So it goes Matthew, Mark, and then Luke. Okay. Remember that Luke was one of Paul's... Um, Students, disciples, kind of sidekicks. That's why he was able to write one of the letters in the New Testament, okay? It was under Paul's supervision. So when we're looking at, that's all right. You just keep doing your thing, Miss Doreen. The, the enemy ain't gonna win because, uh-uh. So let me be, all right, y'all know I'm kind of a stickler for holidays. I would like to say a, a holiday greeting for one of the most important holidays of the church. Today is Pentecost. That's a big deal. Now, next year we'll, we'll do it upright, but Pentecost is not a small thing. It's the day when the Holy Spirit was given to the church. That's incredible. That's a big deal right there. And so, if you grew up in a, in a, in a church that had, you know, church calendar, liturgical, you know, calendar or any of those things, I will say happy Pentecost to you. All right? I think it's an amazing thing that, A, we get to baptize a, a little sister in Christ. <sighs> that's that right there. That's a sermon in itself, amen? There's an old, old hymn. Now, I mean, this one's, this one's like, I don't even know this one. That's how old it is. Talking about the, the stirring of the baptismal waters. I mean, it's like, like, like old pioneer days. Like it's a, like, do you know that? I mean, you're not that, like, it's, it's old, old. Now I'm not saying you're old, old. Sweet Jesus. Throw a chair at me. You know what I meant. Okay, thank you, Jamie. Thank you. Man, I'm buying you lunch today. You got me out of that one. Woo! <laughs> So it's one of those very, like when they did, um, like when the, the circuit preacher would ride through, it was one of those songs. I mean, that's how, but sometimes, you know, if you grew up in a church that was traditional, traditional, they, they sang some of the very old ones, but um, yeah, it was stir the baptismal waters. And it was that notion of, <laughs> it's a great thing when a church has the baptismal waters stirred because that means that Jesus is moving among his people. 
And that's a good thing. <laughs> and I, I, you know, I just, it's one of those days that connects us across the span of 2,000 years, Emily. Every single believer in that moment, whether on earth or in heaven, in that moment, we're all connected. Because we've all, hopefully, <laughs> we've all done that step of obedience in the Lord, right? I remember mine. You know, it's just, it's really cool that it stretches back and you just kind of link spiritual hands with all of those saints in that moment. And I, I love the simplicity of baptism. It's not, it's not this traditional ceremony. It's not this salvific procedure. It's simply telling God, I'm going to obey you. And it tells the church, I'm going to do life with you. See, when you know what baptism really is, it's hard to see anything else in it. When you realize what it really is, it's kind of like, oh, well, of course, baptism doesn't save you. Baptism comes after the salvation. It always has. <laughs> baptism is just identifying yourself with that person who commanded you to be baptized. Well, Jesus is the one that said, go ye therefore into the, in the world, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit. So all we do with those waters, whether it's a trough, I worked at one church where it was on the beach, we baptized people, Jonathan, in the Gulf of Mexico. It was hilarious if you had a big old wave and their feet would, Lord have mercy, that was a kicker. But it, it doesn't matter what you wear. It doesn't matter what, what the water is doing. It, those are the details that have never been important, right, Karen? They've never been important. Now, we as men, we want to make bigger things out of it, right? But in reality, it is just us going, no, no, no. Father, I'm yours and I'm theirs. I just love that. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. All right. <laughs> and then... Uh, we had a, a sister of Christ walk up, you know, when, when I felt like the spirit was like, hey, somebody, you know, salvation. And she came up to me, she goes, I know Jesus, but I need a new kind of salvation. You know, when you know Jesus and he saves your soul, but sometimes you need him to save your life. And if you, you know what I mean when I say that, she was already a sister in Christ. She said, I gave my life to him when I was younger. Grew up in church. Back in the day, we used to call it rededication, didn't we? Uh-huh, that's what our sister did today. She said, no, 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 I know him. I want to step back into his salvation. I want to step back into faith in Christ. And, it, and I thought of that, Jamie, I thought of that old hymn, Standing on the Promises. Because that's her life song now. Standing on the promises of, come on. Through eternal ages, let his praises ring. All right, hold on. Everybody sing it over. Hold on. Jamie, will you start it again for us? Standing in the promises of Christ our King. On the, excuse me. Very big doc, very big difference. I asked him to sing it and he goes, What how did it go again? Lord have mercy. <laughs> Standing on the promises of Christ my King. Through eternal ages, let the praises ring. Glory in the highest, I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. And the beauty of that is no matter what we are in, no matter what season we are in, no matter what struggles that we're in, this isn't even part of the sermon, Missy, <laughs> whatever it is that we are going through in life, the promises of Christ have never and will never change, do they, Job? They never do so we can bank on them, can't we, Joyce? And we can stand on them and we can strap ourselves to them. Anchored in Jehovah, I will not be moved. Remember that one? Come on, girl. <laughs> I love you so much. <laughs> the beauty of when we say, and it's the VBS theme this year, isn't it? Breaker Rock Beach. It's the notion of we will stand on the rock. Because only standing on the rock, our lives are protected. They're safe in him. When we are anchored in Christ, that is the only way that we will not float away when the storms come. That is just such a beautiful reminder. Such a beautiful reminder. All right.
Now let's get into Luke. Hey, <laughs> so when we say chapter three, we're gonna start in verse one. So starting at the beginning, <laughs> I wanna make you aware of four things that when we look at Luke, there are four things that are gonna happen before Jesus starts his ministry, okay? <clears throat> they are significantly important. Um, one of them we're talking about today. So these are the four things. Number one, John the baptizer, John shows up. Remember, he's the prophetic forerunner. He is the guy that comes before the Messiah like prophecy said he would. Number two, Jesus gets baptized. That is, bless you. That is John aligning himself with, um, excuse me, that is Jesus aligning himself with John's ministry saying, no, 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 I'm the guy that he foretold. And it also sets example to his followers that will come of how they are now to be in line with Jesus. You see, if Jesus wasn't baptized, but he, he commanded us to be baptized, we would be aligned with John's teachings. Remember, baptism is simply aligning yourself with the authority that is telling you be baptized. So if Jesus wanted to get baptized, we would still be aligned under John's authority. And Jesus is like, no, 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 no. I'm going to ask my followers to be baptized in my name so they are aligned under my authority. Did Jesus have to be baptized? No. I mean, he's God. He made Jupiter for fun. He doesn't have to do anything he doesn't want to do. He was doing it to reset baptism for us so that when we are baptized, we are under his authority. We are aligning our identity with him. Make sense? Amen. Okay, amen, that's right. <laughs> saying amen is like saying stick him to a bulldog. That's a good thing. All right, the third thing is Jesus' genealogy, and we see that coming later. And that is the way that you make the credentials of the Messiah, that he is from David's lineage, okay? Because that's other prophetic things of he will be in the line of David and his kingdom will have no end and all that. So the lineage that Luke pops in there, that Matthew also pops in is, I know it's boring reading it because you're like, oh my gosh, Jezither, Begat, for Father, and it just, these names, and you're like, how on God's green earth? Does it matter? Yes. Is it okay to skip it when you read it? Yes. I mean, let's not be over spiritual. Does it matter? Yes. Is Jesus more impressed with you that you can pronounce all those names? No, <laughs> no, because you just need to understand why it's in the scripture. It's in there for his credentials. It's connecting him to Abraham. It's connecting him to David. It's connecting him to Rahab and all of those people, okay? It's credentials. Don't get bogged down in it because it, you know, that's it. <laughs> the fourth thing is, after all of these things, Jesus goes into the wilderness for 40 days and he's tempted. That's the fourth major thing. Now, we'll get there, like, you know, month or from now. I don't know when. I don't know. But we'll get there because it's important that Jesus understands struggle like a human because when he tells us in scripture later that he went through everything we went through, he understands the struggle. He had to go through them for him to be able to say that. I mean, could you imagine trying to serve a God that does not know what your daily life is like? Any of y'all ever had, I don't know, you know, the enemy questioning your identity, your worth, your loyalty? How many of y'all have ever thought, man, I could just leave the church and just be done with this. I got other things that I need to do in my world. Sure. Jesus was tempted the same things. Any of y'all ever had struggles with a stepfather? Anybody a struggle with a step parent? Jesus had them. Hello, Joseph was his stepdad. So Jesus understands, but he had to go through things and he had to be tempted by the enemy to question his very identity as the son of God. Now, we're gonna get to those things, but I just want you to recognize those things have to happen before the ministry starts because those things validate the ministry. Does that make sense? Okay, now let's go on to verse one. <clears throat> verse one, it says, now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod was tetrarch of Galilee. His brother Philip was tetrarch in the regions of Iterea, of Trachonitis, of Lysanias, that one always gets me, and tetrarch of Abilene, not Texas, calm down. Verse two, and in the high priesthood of Ananias, uh, Annas and Sapphira, uh, yeah, suffice, okay? Or Caiaphas, if you want to go there. 
<laughs> now you go, why did Luke throw that at us? Do you remember what we've been talking about from the beginning? Luke is wanting to make sure that we don't just put our faith in a story. He's giving us factual evidence. He's giving us timelines. Remember, he went and interviewed people that saw these things. He wants to give us a complete chrono chronological book so that we can trust in what he's saying. And of course, he's like, hey, in the 15th year of the Caesar, Tiberius, when all these other guys were ruling, is when Jesus, is when Jesus came to be baptized. So he wanted you to know it's not just fluff. It's not, well, he did it. No, no, we can tell you the year. Very important, okay? <laughs> Let's go to the next slide. So when you look at this, y'all know I'm a stickler for archaeology and all of those like little things. All of these guys did not serve at the same time. It wasn't like they all had an eight-year track and they were all stacked on top of each other. No, 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 their reigns overlapped, like, for instance, look at Herod and Philip. They both started in 4 BC. Well, Pilate started in 26 AD in his office. So the beautiful part, Lynette, is that they all overlapped in this sliver of time. In about 26 to 27 AD was the 15th year of Tiberius. <laughs> Shane, you'll like this one. <laughs> one of the critiques of our critics that say, well, you can't believe the gospel of Luke, is we know that Caesar Augustus, who was Tiberius' stepfather, he stopped reigning in 14 AD. Now you go 14 AD is the start, you go 15 years later, that looks like 29, right? That's basic math. Well, we know that the church got the calendar off a little bit, right? Well, here's one of the things that our critics don't know. Tiberius, the stepson of Caesar Augustus, the guy that made the census that they had to go to all Bethlehem and all those places. In the last two years of his reign, he was very old and kind of decrepit and losing his facilities. And his stepson Tiberius was such a strong general and such a good leader. Because remember, if you had the support of the army in ancient Rome, you were pretty much a shoe in. And what they did was they let Tiberius and Caesar Augustus, they let them co-rule two years before Augustus died. So actually, Tiberius started reigning in 12 you see, it's little things like that that I cannot stress enough to you. The Bible is full of these little nuggets of truth. You can trust what it says. It is archaeologically, it is scientifically, it is historically proven to be accurate over and over again. <laughs> Miss Linda, there was a time when we thought Pontius Pilate was like a, kind of like a Paul Bunyan figure, you know, like like legend kind of thing, because we didn't have evidence that Pilate existed. Well, in 1964, they found a, a piece of stone that said uh, a temple being dedicated to Tiberius Caesar from Pontius Pilate, and then it put the year. We still have it. It's in the Jerusalem Museum. It's things like that that we know this book is real. We just need everybody else to catch up to it. It's like, no, it's, there are so many things like that. And so never forget, this is Luke's motivation to give you cold, hard facts so that you know, oh, okay, it was in about 26 to 27 AD that, that John was baptizing in the wilderness. Okay, sounds good. All right, let's go to 2B. Next slide. <clears throat> Ms. Doreen, next slide. You're good. Now, this is the second part of the second verse. The word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he came in all the districts around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. A couple of things. Number one, when it says the word of God came, that is, Terry, that's a way in the Old Testament when they phrased that someone was a prophet. It was said of Zechariah, I mean, of uh, 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 Zechariah, it was said of Ezekiel, of Jeremiah, of Isaiah, all these Old Testament prophets. The word of the Lord came to, that's a way of saying, hey, he's a prophet. So they're using the same lingo in this book going, John is a prophet. Don't lose sight of that. He's the son of Zechariah. 
Do y'all remember when we looked at Zachariah? Remember his dad? Remember when he was visited by an angel? Where was Zachariah? He was in the temple, remember? He was the guy that was selected in the lottery of priests to put the incense, remember that? John was of a Levite family. He was a, not royal, he was a priestly lineage and he chunked deuce at it, Matthew. You cannot get more elite than being a priest in Jerusalem. And he said, nah, I'm gonna go live in the wilderness with God. That cannot be understated enough. Now, when it says a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, this is where some of our wonderful denominational friends that believe that baptism is part of salvation, they point to this scripture. They go, ah, see, baptism for forgiveness. Well, it's, an, it's a misinterpretation because I go, I go again and I say this a thousand times. We said it in the youth group this morning. <laughs> baptism cannot save you because baptism cannot die on a cross for you. Reading scripture cannot save you because the Bible cannot die on the cross for you. Church attendance cannot save you because the church cannot die on the cross for you. The only thing that can save you is the blood of Christ because that's the only one that died on the cross for you. <laughs> and when you have an understanding of what biblical baptism was, like we've talked about, it's actually hard to make a case that baptism can save you. So let me, let me, let me give you a kind of a, an easier way of understanding what it's saying a good paraphrase to this verse is, <clears throat> excuse me, it's not baptism that leads to salvation. It's proclaiming the duty to all people to repent on the grounds of their repentance, be baptized, and with a view of forgiveness of their sins. Repentance is what we have to have to follow Jesus. It's a turning away from our old life and going towards our new life in Christ. That's what he wants. That's why the Old Testament and the New Testament talk about sin so much. Now, we don't like it when preachers talk about sin, do we, Missy? Because we don't want them to dance on our toes and get in our business. But it's actually not a preacher thing. It's a, it's a gospel thing. Why, Jonathan, why do you need Jesus outside of forgiving you of your sin? No, no, that, she, he was like, I don't have an answer. There isn't one. I tricked you. That was awesome. The look on his face was like, um, I don't know. <laughs> Good job, because if you had an answer, I'd be worried. <laughs> Think about it. Why do you need Jesus to forgive you of your sin and rebuild the relationship that's eternal between you and he? And so when we look at baptism of repentance, <laughs> being baptized, Elena said today, I'm repenting of my old life. I'm following Jesus. I'm accepting the new life. The old is gone. That water didn't forgive her sin. It's a symbol of what happened in her. And that's beauty right there. It's almost poetry, isn't it, Sheila? Going down into that water, symbolizing dying to death and, 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 and your old life. And like Christ was dead on that cross and put in that tomb. When you come out of that water, Bruce, it's like, no, no, I'm living the new life that Christ has purchased for me. I'm repenting of my old. I am validating the new and pursuing it. That's poetry and water right there. That's what John is trying to get them to realize. Okay, <clears throat> there's one thing that I wanted to tell you. I learned this. I might've already should have known this, but I learned it, Jamie. Luke does not include the physical description of John the baptizer. Matthew and Mark do. Matthew 3 and Mark 1, it says that John wore a coat of camel's hair <laughs> and a leather belt. I don't mind a leather belt. I'm still over the camel's hair. Did he wash it? James, did he wash it? Those people didn't bathe regularly. That camel hair was functified. And then, here's the kicker. <laughs> he ate locusts and honey. <laughs> I'd rather eat In-N-Out Burger than eat a locust. And let me tell you, that's the bottom of my totem pole with a burger. All right. <laughs> Calm down, ex-Californian. <laughs> she loves Jesus. That's why she's here. All right. 
I didn't, I never real. I was like, that's just weird. Like, camel hair and a leather belt, and then he ate bugs and honey. That's gross. Just gross. And then I realized, well, there's actually other prophets in the Old Testament in Exodus 10 and Joel 2 that they wore hairy jackets to symbolize their weird. Literally, to, to stand out. Okay, I can get that. Like, but okay. I'd have to wash it every once in a while, but... <laughs> but the bugs and honey, Kayla. I'm like, I've ne- I'm like, this is weird and gross. Could you imagine having a conversation with his breath? <laughs> Man, when you said repent, people took it literal. All right, dude, I'm out. <laughs> like, bye. <laughs> well, I was I was looking through commentaries and I was looking at websites and I'm I'm just trying to, <laughs> and then it, I read it said, um, locusts in scripture are the symbol of divine judgment coming on upon a people. Think ancient Egypt with the Passover when they sent locusts in it. it locu- a cloud of locusts will devour a field of crops in minutes. And I mean, think of what a crop failure does for an agrarian ancient society. That town will die. But then a little bit further it said, but wild honey symbolizes abundance and blessing of the Lord. Like when you're going to go in the promised land, it's the land flowing with milk. And (laughs) John's diet is an illustration of his job. Point to Jesus because people will either be destroyed because of him or blessed in him. What? Why did I not ever learn that before? You knew that though, didn't you? You did, of course you did. <laughs> but I love the imagery of, because John is just the neon sign that points to Jesus. John is literally the pace car that's just starting NASCAR out. And I love that his very diet, bro, his very diet is saying, you will either know him and be blessed or you will reject him and be devoured. I'm just going to leave that one there. Let's go into verse four. Now, so he's, he's in the wilderness. He's coming out of Jordan. He's starting to preach this. And this is what he says. As is in, uh, let's try that in English. As it is written in the book of the word of Isaiah the prophet, So this is John saying out what he's doing from the Old Testament. A voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. Every ravine will be filled. Every mountain and hill will be brought low. The crooked will be made straight and the rough road smooth and all flesh will see the salvation of the Lord. And I'm like, okay, that's pretty cool. (laughs) <laughs> but I'll confess something to you. <clears throat> Excuse me. Logan, I've always been a little curious at why Jesus would need somebody else to make his path straight. That's weird. I'm like, I mean, he made Jupiter because he wanted it to exist. Like zebras got stripes instead of polka dots because he wanted it that way. Does he really need a path being made straight? And then I got to digging into commentaries about Isaiah 40, which is this verse. You got to remember back in those days, Miss Sandra, they didn't have interstates, right? There wasn't a Bucky's on every Jerusalem corner. I mean, there should have been. That'd been amazing. But <clears throat> when a king was going somewhere, he would literally have crews of people going in the wilderness and making roads and clearing rocks out of the way and finding the path that is the straightest path to save him the most amount of time. He had road crews. Only kings did it. And I love that John is Jesus's road crew. It's not about does Jesus need a road cleared? It's no, 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 no. The people that heard that knew that John was saying, I'm clearing the road for the king. They knew what that meant. So all of a sudden, when Jesus shows up, it's like, oh, bro, that's the king? The king that we've been waiting on for 400? Oh. 
It would not have fallen on deaf ears with them, Debbie. They would have known exactly what king he was talking about. So that's why it says, I come to make the path straight. <clears throat> Let's go to the next one. <clears throat> Excuse me. Verse seven. So he began saying to the crowds who were going out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Now, if you grew up like me and Miss Nelly and you had a hellfire and brimstone pastor, that was just a Sunday, wasn't it? But I remember reading it again and I was like, that's weird, Bruce. All of these people are coming out to get baptized by him for the repentance of sin. Like they want to repent. They want to live for, you know, for God. And he's calling them a brood of vipers. Well, that's not employee of the month. Like what, anybody else, does anybody else kind of go, that's a little weird that you would scream that at the people that are coming to. And then if you're a note taker, write this down. <clears throat> scripture interprets scripture. You ever start reading a verse? Read the verse before it and the verse after it. Scripture interprets scripture. Scripture will never conflict each other. It will never. So I got to thinking, well, did another gospel, did, did, did Matthew or Mark or John, did they have something that just happened or is Luke just losing it? And guess what? In John, verse one, chapter 19 through 28, we see who he's calling vipers. It wasn't the common people that were coming to get baptized. Let's check this out. John 1, 19 through 28. This is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent him priests and Levites, the Jews sent him guys from the temple to start stirring things up. There you go. To ask him, who are you? And he confessed and he did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? Because they, they had a belief that Elijah was gonna come back. Well, we know that he did come back. He stood on the Mount of Transfiguration, but he didn't come back the way they wanted him to. And he said, I'm not. Well, are you the prophet? And he answered, no. And they said to him, who are you that we may give an answer to those who sent us? So Caiaphas, Annas and Caiaphas, the high priest had sent these guys out to go, go figure out what that rabble rouser's doing out there, that troublemaker, stirring up people to love God more. What do you say about yourself? <laughs> verse, 20, verse 23, he said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord. As Isaiah the prophet said. Now we know what he just slammed down, didn't he? We know, because we've already we know now the symbolism. They oh, he rang a bell. Let's go on to the next one. But now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They asked him and said to him, Why are you baptizing if you're not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? And John answered them, saying, I baptize in water. <clears throat> but among you stands one. He already been talking about the king. I make way. He's saying the king is amongst you right now. You better recognize. <laughs> I baptize in water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. But he who comes after me, the throng of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. These things took place in Bethany beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. So John gives a little bit. Now remember, John was written after Luke. <laughs> well, Matthew and Mark and Luke don't tell who was getting called vipers. And John was like, oh baby, I gotta fill you in. It was them punks from the temple. <laughs> I love how these four guys just work together. I mean, they weren't, I mean, years apart, but they're using each other's manuscripts and they're using each other's witnesses. And it's like, no, 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 no. Oh, they forgot to put this. I need to put this in so there's a little bit better context. I love that. I love that. Now let's go on. <laughs> Let me make sure. Okay, uh, back up one, Miss Doreen. I apologize. You did the right thing. I, I just was not ready yet. <clears throat> I love, actually, yeah, go to verse eight. Sorry. Verse eight. So we're back to what Luke says. 
Therefore, this is John speaking to the people. Therefore, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. For I say to you that unless these stones, unless that from these stones, God is able to raise up children of Abraham. Like your religious pedigree is nothing. Your church attendance is nothing. Verse nine, indeed, the ax is already laid to the root of the trees so that every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. <laughs> John is warning the crowd. Now that the temple punks had showed up and tried to puff up and be all religious and holy, John's looking at the crowd now, Terry, and he goes, hey guys, keep fruit with repentance. Stick to what you believe. Keep turning away from the world and living for God. Don't, don't get caught up in the, well, I'm a Jew. I'm, I'm of Abraham. It's like, God can make believers out of these rocks. Your religious pedigree, your church attendance, your years, that means nothing. In fact, there's an ax waiting to cut down those trees that don't bear fruit, meaning there are some people who will not believe in Christ. We've talked about that before, haven't we? Some people do not want him. Heartbreaking for us, but reality. Some people don't want him. I have an aunt who I love dearly, spent tons of time around her growing up, who does not believe that Jesus is God. Do, does that break my heart? Yes. Do I love her? Yeah. Have I talked to her about it? Oh, yeah. Did it change anything? No. It's reality in my family. We know it. <clears throat> but pay attention to what says thrown into the fire because we're going to need that in a minute, okay? He's telling them, number one, bear fruit. Your faith should bear fruit. You plant a blackberry bush in your backyard within three years, you better have blackberries on it. Bear fruit. Colossians 1 9 through 12, it says, for this reason also, since the day we've heard it, we have not ceased to pray for you and ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Verse 10, so that you walk in a, wor excuse me, that you walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might and attaining all the steadfastness and patience and joy giving thanks to the Father for those who qualified us and sharing in the inheritance of the saints of life. Miss Neldy, I thought of you when I read this scripture. I thought of you and Miss Diane. I did. <laughs> we have several people in our church that they volunteer in the next gen ministry. And for that, I am so grateful, genuinely. But no one that serves in the next gen ministry is doing it for bonuses, paychecks, impressing Jesus. The people that serve in our next gen ministry realize that if they do not stand and invest in that next generation, how will that next generation know the gospel? I love seeing you come out of that room. I know that you are emotionally just tattered. She works with the preschool and the nursery. She loves the babies, but the babies sometimes are wild and woolly. Y'all know you take them home. But it, it touches my heart because I know you I know you know if somebody will not go sit in those rooms and let those babies scream and play and cry and all that business, they will never be able to hear that Jesus loves you. They will never be able to hear the stories that we heard that the guys, <laughs> do y'all remember if you grew up in the church? Raise your hand if you grew up in, as a kid in the church. You had a Sunday school teacher, didn't you? And that person was loyal to you air Sunday. They never got to go to adult Sunday school, ever. Fourth, second to fourth grade, Joanne Wiggins. Still remember her. I will bear hug her in heaven. Lord have mercy. You think Everett's bad. Whoo, he ain't nothing compared to what I was. She showed up every Sunday, faithful. She was ready with that lesson. With the book. Remember the book? Oh, yeah. 
I mean, we got to up our game if we want to be of that level of saints because sometimes we can't get once a month people showing up. That's beside the point. You know what I mean? As you like, we had adults that were like, every Sunday I will be dedicated to those children and their future in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Fruit. Because we know it's important. Because by our fruit is what we feed that next generation so they can understand that it's cyclical. I serve you, you grow, and you serve others. They grow, they serve others. If there's a breakdown in the supply chain, there's gonna be a breakdown in the church. And then we start wondering, we start posting things like, we need God in schools again. No, 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 no. We need God in church. We need people to stand up and go, I will not let the enemy have our children, not in the courthouse square on National Prayer Day, not on school boards and substitute teaching. And We need people to stand up in the church and say they won't have our kids. So if you want to sign up for the next, no, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Sorry, I really, the point was, it is so encouraging when people dedicate themselves to the Lord's kingdom because fruit will grow. You know, and another thing that he says, he's like, be real and don't be pious. Holy is not pious. Pious is like, oh, look at me. I am not a sinner. I am holy. Look at me. No, no, that's that's not what Jesus is after. He couldn't care about your your, your piousness. He wants you to be real. Don't bank on your, your, your traditions growing up. Don't bank on how much scripture you know. Bank on the guy that wrote the scripture. Bank on the guy that penned it. Bank on the guy that made Pluto. And when we read Isaiah 29, 13, it says, then the Lord said, because this people draws near with their words and honor me with their lip service, but they remove their hearts far from me and their reverence for me consists of tradition. That's one of those scriptures of ouch. And then the last one, There's fire. There's fire. I'm not going to read it, but you can. Matthew 25, 31 through 46. It's one of those scriptures that talks about there is eternal punishment. It's real. It's not philosophical. It's real. So let's go on to verse 10. (laughs) I love this. So he's talking about, okay, don't be this way. All right. Bear fruit, don't be religious and pious, but like be real and don't forget there is a fire. (laughs) And then the crowds were questioning and saying, then what shall we do? I love it. You remember when you first got, uh, you first accepted Christ and you were like, what do I do? Or like ladies, when y'all come back from Emmaus and you're like, well, let's do this. That excitement, that's what they're doing. It's like, all right, all right, Jay, what do we do then? What do we do? Like, we're ready. (laughs) Let's do this. And I love his response. Look at this. And he said, "Um, okay, the man who has two tunics, share with him that has none. Share one of them. Be generous. Be loving. Be attentive to other people's needs. (laughs) And he who has food, do likewise. Look at me. Don't you go in your cupboard and get the canned food so that you don't want and donate them to the church. (laughs) Don't you do that. And you go, well, pastor, I'm being charitable. No, you're not. You're being cleanly, and we don't want that. If you don't want to eat it, people that don't have probably, look, I know what I like. I like French cut green beans out of that uh, Jolly Green Giant can. Look, if I'm poor and starving, I'll eat what they give, but I would prefer to have French cut green beans with the Jolly Green Giant. Ho, ho, ho. You know what I'm saying? The younger people are like, ho, 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 green giant. Y'all remember that jingle? <laughs> Look, do to others what you want them to do to you is not just a tagline. He meant it, didn't he, Miss Laverne? He meant it. I love it. Let's keep going. Verse 12. And some of the tax collectors, they were being baptized. Woo! And they said, teacher, what, 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 what should we do? And he's like, okay, collect no more than you would have to be ordered. Don't steal from people. Don't cheat people. Don't, like, do right. Okay, (laughs) and then verse 13, then he said, no, uh, verse 14, and soldiers, now this is a big one. This is Roman soldiers coming up to a Jewish prophet. This is a big deal. 
Uh, what about us? <laughs> look, he just look at us. Uh, can't you hear guys say, we, uh, hey, uh, crazy camel guy? <laughs> what about us? What should we do? And he said to them, don't take money from anyone by force or accuse anyone falsely. Be content with your wages. I love that. Treat people fairly. Treat people with dignity and respect. You Roman soldier that have every right legally to kill them and embarrass them and steal them, do you know legally they could force you to carry their gear for one mile and you couldn't say a thing? And if you, if you said no, they could kill you. And he's just like, just love people, treat them fairly. Even if you differ with them, I don't know, politically, ethnically, religiously, because treat them with dignity. I love that. I love that the sermon of baptism is about bear fruit and don't worry about being religious. Just be real with people. Doesn't mean you have to agree with people. I got news for you. <laughs> if a person came in this church and sat in one of your chairs and they were homosexual, I'm going to love them. I'm going to respect them. I'm going to treat them kindly. I'm going to hug their neck and say, welcome to church. It doesn't mean I have to agree with them. I know what scripture says, but I want them to be loved in this place so they can hear the truth of Christ. We don't have to agree with what they say. We tried that for 50 or 60 years in the church. Didn't go too well, did it? We kind of lost that war, didn't we? Let's change tactics. Let's actually do what scripture says. <laughs> now I say this to victory, that if you've been at Victor Church for a hot minute, you know we already are that church and have been for a long time, a church of love. <clears throat> We're just going to keep doing what scripture says. But I love that that was John's message. Just, just repent of your old life and live as someone who knows the holy God of the cosmos. You see, first Peter says, be holy because he is holy. We're not perfect. We're going to fall but we get back up and we hit that restart button, don't we? And when we can't stay in, we let other people around us carry us. That's called family. I love that. I love it when Christianity is not about us, but about him. I love when we're not the standard, he's the standard. I love that we can be broken and hurting and wounded and, and just toe up from the flow up. And Jesus is like, oh baby, I got you, come on. Remember that cheesy poem that our moms used to have framed in our house somewhere? Footprints in sand. It's cheesy, but it had a good point. Love that point. <laughs> so if you don't know the poem, it's that um, I had a dream one day that there were two footprints in the sand and it was me and God walking. Well, then I looked back on my life and I noticed that sometimes there was only one footprint in sand. And I said to God, God, why did you abandon me? And he went, oh, baby, that's when I was carrying you. Cheesy, Lord, yes, Velveeta. <laughs> True, yes, yes. I love, I mean, what has your world been other than the Savior carrying you? Because he's good. Amen. Even when our fists are beating against his chest going, I don't understand, or I'm hurting, or I'm lonely, or I'm watching them go through this or there's more money than there is. I mean, there's more bills than there is money or whatever it is. My marriage is falling apart. And he's like, oh, baby, I got you. Remember, I'm the rock. I'm your anchor. You hold me and I, you know how many people Jesus has ever lost? You know how many people a thousand years from now Jesus has lost? He's just not in the losing game. He's in the finding game. And if he's found you, you hold on to him with everything you have. Start being the crazy Christian on your block. Yeah, girl. <laughs> now, I'm gonna say this, and I'm not saying this to you. I'm saying this to everybody. Some of us have the crazy down pat. We need the Christian crazy down pat, all right? All right? Like, that's why I said, I'm not talking to you. Like, everybody. <laughs> but, but seriously, you know one of the things that our church is gonna do? We're gonna take an ad out in the program, the football program, 
uh, for West Columbia in the fall. Because I want the people that open up that program to know we are a church for families and we love our kids. We're doing VBS because we want to tell kids about Jesus. We want to love on our community. Stick horse rodeos and all that stuff. We want to love our community because that is what we're called to do. Take the light of Christ to everyone. We're going to bear fruit, whether it's through being servants, being charitable, being honest, or just being content. Just being content. Don't ask the Lord for something bigger and better if you're not using what you got for him now. I'm going to say that again. Don't ask the Lord for something bigger and better. More money, better job, bigger house, better car, better vacations, that RV that you've been coveting, I mean looking at. If you're not living for the Lord now with what you got, let's check that. Every parent knows you wouldn't give your kids $100 in in, um, allowance if they're not taking care of 20. Same thing. Let's pray. (laughs) As the prayer team, excuse me, as the praise team comes back up. The beauty of today is just, if you need to hit the restart button, hit the restart button. If you need to call it rededication, we'll call it that. If you want to call it restart, we'll call it that. If you want to start, if you want to call it his mercies are new every morning, we're going to call it that. But when you hit those doors and you're leaving, just do me a favor, leave different than what you came in. Even if you and Jesus are great right now, leave all your praises at the altar because he's worthy of it, isn't he? (laughs) If you are hurting, hey, you've got a family that will travel with you down the road with that hurt, whether it's physical, emotional, marital, financial, whatever it is. We know the God that makes Jupiter. You're not alone. Do not let the enemy tell you that you're alone because that's not true. When you walk out those doors, make sure that you are ready to bear fruit for the Lord. He deserves it. And he's equipped us to do it. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. I thank you for this church. Thank you for every single person here, Father. Whether victory is their home or they're just a guest and visiting, I thank you that they're here because you have ordained everyone being here this morning that you wanted here. So Father, I ask you to be with them. I ask you to show them who you are. I ask you to deepen your relationship with them. If they don't know you, I pray that they would give their life to you this morning. Father, I pray that they would understand that you are the God of the universe and you love them. That's why Jesus went to that cross for them, because you love them. (laughs) Father, if there is someone in this room this morning that needs you to be their healer, whether it's physical, emotional, mental, I know that there's several people in our church that need healing this morning. I pray that you would be the great physician, the balm of Gilead that you would absolutely touch them and heal them this morning. Father, if there is someone here that needs freedom, if they need freedom from addiction, pain, healing from an abusive past that they're still chained to, Words that other people have said to them, I pray that you would be the chain breaker this morning. You would destroy the holds that the enemy has in their lives. And Father, if there are hearts this morning that just need to be lifted, lift them, Father. Lift their eyes to the hills to see where their help comes from but let no one leave the same way they came in, Father. Ask these things in the name of Christ, our King. If you need somebody to pray with, I'll be up here. Um, Shane will be up here. Jamie will be up here. We would love to pray with y'all if you need us. Um, If you wanna accept Christ this morning, yes. (laughs) Yes. If you're kind of scared of coming up to the front, grab a friend, grab your spouse and say, hey, come pray with me. Grab a stranger. Man, spice up their morning this morning. (laughs) All right, let's continue to worship the Lord in song.